I'd now like to welcome up our next panelist. We have Nathan Schneider, Molly McKinley, Suji Yan, and Zach Zeward from Coindesk moderating a discussion on decentralized social media, what it means, and how we get there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. Hope everyone's having a good day. Um, so first of all, if you all could introduce yourselves, you're going to unpack in detail who you are. I'm going to simplify you down into one dimension for the sake of a good conversation. So first of all, that's what's going to happen. But it starts with real introduction. So Molly, please take it away. Tell us who you are and what you do. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Molly McKinley. I lead the PL Andres team, which is a 110 or 20 person engineering, product development, research development organization building core protocols like IPFS, Filecoin, LibP2P, IPLD, DRAND, um, really the foundation of these Web3 protocols uh, that hopefully will back decentralized social media and make it something that we can actually take advantage of. Hello everyone, Suji here from Mass Network. We start from 2018, we're leading Web3 decentralized social network. Basically we're building a layer on top of Twitter, Facebook, um, Instagram, any Web2 platform you're using and instead of let user to migrate from Web2 to Web3, we bridge the two together. And back in 2019, when uh, Jadossi initiated Blue Sky, we're the early funding community member and we're still working with all the player and try to bridge the two work together. Um, now we also need an active supporter to provide grants to um, new infra in the West Street social. Yeah. I'm Nathan Schneider. I'm a professor of media studies at the University of Colorado Boulder, and uh, run a lab there called the Media Enterprise Design Lab. Uh, my shill for the day, I guess, is uh, in September. Uh, a book's coming out that I've been editing, uh, a collection of Vitalik Buterin's writings. It's called, uh, very appropriately, Proof of Stake. So look out for that. All right, good stuff. So uh, clearly decentralized social media has been in the headlines of late with the Elon Musk Twitter takeover saga unfolding to maximum effect. But that is the backdrop for this conversation and this lovely title, Not Another Billionaire, How to Decentralize Social Media. For the purposes of this conversation, I am going to be, pretend to be a decentralized social media bear. In my experience covering crypto, every blockchain tries to do a decentralized Twitter and inevitably it fails miserably because no one comes. People want to be where the party is. That network effect of social media is real. You can tweet that or you can go on another protocol and do that and see what happens. All right, so what I'm going to ask Nathan, uh, before we dive into the how, I want to set up the context of the what and the why, especially why it matters. Why should we care about building a decentralized social media? You know, I, I first kind of fell in love with Twitter when I was a reporter during the Arab Spring. It was, a, it was such a, I was a movement journalist. I was covering social movements as my job. And I depended on that to be able to follow what was happening around the world during that time. And then a few years later, when um, there was an earlier round of rumors of acquisition of Twitter, it kind of shocked me that this thing that had become such an important public utility that was you know, such an important part of how I did my job and how the public sphere was shaping up was just actually the whole time a commodity to be bought and sold. Um, so out of that, I, 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 I banded together with some friends. We started a shareholder campaign that went to the Twitter annual meeting calling on the company to explore user ownership. It got a lot of media coverage at the time suggesting that, uh, you know, kind of like, oh, isn't that a cute, crazy idea? This time around, when the Musk deal started showing up, we didn't have to do that because lots of people were already starting to, you know, were, the idea that Twitter should be something other than what it is, that it should be in the hands of the people who use it, um, that it should be, um, as bottom-up in its structure, its deep structure, as it feels in its daily use, um, is something that I think has really spread, partly because of crypto, um, partly just because of the deep sense uh, that, 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 that this way of doing things has failed, that we need a more bottom-up, more accountable way of doing, um, uh, of doing social media. And you know, decentralization is one way that we could achieve that. Molly, I kind of love that we're coming out of the public goods panel and coming into a discussion with social media, which, you know, to many people in the room is that utility that we use day in, day out to communicate, to learn, and so much more. So, Molly, same question to you. What is, what is your rationale, 
your bull case for why you're contributing so much of your life and your energy to building something that may be a better version of what we currently have? Yeah, I really think the, the Blue Sky team has, has said it well. There's, there's a set of things, a set of primitives we want our decentralized social networks to do that in the centralized version, they just can't do well for us. Um, you want data portability. You want when a social network goes down and closes its doors, like with Vine, um, or, or stops kind of serving the needs of its user community, that community owns their data, and they can move that data from one platform to another that is going to like respect their needs and, and enable them to cooperate and act with each other the way they want to. So you need a, a foundation for social media that enables that kind of like uh, self-ownership, uh, self-data authenticity, so that you don't need to rely on that central in intermediary to host and address all of the data for you. Um, the other thing you want is the ability to, to kind of understand and look into what's happening um, kind of like at a at the compute layer of your network. You, you want to know what algorithms are acting on your data, and you want kind of the, the decision on whether or not those are working for you and whether or not you want to fork your community um, and, and set different practices, different paradigms. Again, right now, if you put all of those hands in Twitter and those get bought by another billionaire, uh, you're kind of... Uh, you're required to accept the changes that he makes to the network, um, whereas those, those controls should really be in the hands of the community and that they can change and switch to a different network if they want. And so it's like those freedoms, kind of at a freedom of speech, freedom of organization perspective, that actually should be embedded more deeply into the technology behind our social media platforms. Okay, I love that. We sort of have the why and the what. Now we're going to shift to the how, and that's where I'm typecasting you, Suji. You are the how. You've been building this project mass, number, mass Network for a number of years, and you have a unique approach to how you're trying to do it that I think is different than some of the other experiments out there. Talk to me about why you chose sort of this parasitic approach to making social media more decentralized. Yeah, I, I kind of agree with you on the at least 10 blockchain tried to say we build our own Twitter and they all fail. Like they said, oh, ghost town, none of them achieve million user, right? And, if you think in peer-to-peer -peer network in general, there's the Mapstone. Um, it's federated, it got four million users, but compared to Twitter, it's, uh, it's just a small user number, right? So when I started Mass in 2018, I decided to not follow their trend. I tried to <clears throat> not let people to move away from Twitter, but upgrade themselves. Just imagine like Twitter is a land, right? It's, um, it's our country or something like that. You just not really need to run away to immigrate to another country. Just say, hey, okay, we learn Web3 within this country and we upgrade ourselves from digital labor, digital slaves to digital citizen, and you then fight for your vote. I think that's the right way um, I've been seeing in the, in, the, in, the, in the physical history in the Europe, in the American Revolution, and I think this thing is going to happen in the digital world, in the cyberspace. It's the same revolution. So that's why Max is trying to say, don't leave Twitter or Facebook. You can stay there, and we can parasite on top of it, and we connect you to Web3. And over the years, um, those under, underlay infrastructure become much more mature, right? There's IPFS, there's the you know, Ethereum Layer 2, uh, EVM-compatible chains, DID, um, all these things can connect together. And then that pushed Twitter or Blue Sky one step forward. But even without Elon Musk or without Blue Sky, I think this is going to happen sooner or later. And it's all about enlightening the people, enlightening the user. It's not about like say, hey, I'll give you $5 and go that blockchain. That's not going to work. Yeah. Okay, Nathan, I'm taking this one to you. So I think, um, you know, there's some really... I think like we look at the era of Web2 platforms, right? They prioritize mass scale, reach everybody. And I don't necessarily think that that paradigm will work in the Web3 social media era, right? Instead, it's sort of this federation of little different countries, right? Deep dive communities that really care about something and might be pretty small. So in terms of sort of quantifying what the success of Web3 social media could look like, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think that's a great point that, that one of the deep problems with Web2 is what uh, my collaborator Amy Hazanoff and I have been identifying as scalability, which is a logic that VCs demand in the Web2 economy, which is that you scale without actually changing in anything fundamental about the system, which is one size fits all rules, which is a lack of local governance. And we contrast that to the idea of subsidiarity, which is how like 
other institutions in human history scale, which is to say that you make sure that local decisions can be made locally. And global decisions, well, maybe they have to be made globally, but there aren't that many of them. Um, you know, think of courts, you think of local governments, all sorts of things. It's not that hard. It's actually just Web 2 that's very weird. Um, and so one of the outgrowths of that 2016-17 Twitter shareholder campaign is a group of us who were part of it, a bunch of people, you know, rallied to organize it, set up um, uh, a Mastodon instance called social.coop. It's a wonderful space. It's a, it, it is itself organized as a cooperative using uh, a wonderful platform called Open Collective. Um, and we you know, self-govern it transparently. We make decisions using a tool called Lumio. Um, and we're connected to the broader Fediverse, uh, which means that we can connect to other instances, but we set our own rules about how we interact with that broader world. Um, and, and that kind of approach, I think, is you know, has been very rewarding. It's a, it's a happy space. You know, whereas Twitter, you enter in there and you're just kind of like, you know, what am I going to hit? You know, what, am I, what kind of, like, horrible abuse am I going to get today? You know, that does not happen in, in that kind of, in, in a space that is human scaled. And so I think one of the great challenges uh, that, and opportunities that we have is to build these more kind of human scaled, subsidiarity based uh, platforms where we can actually come to terms with the challenges we face. I think that you know the fundamental problems with Web 2 around you know one size fits all rules, the things that have enabled vast human rights abuses, really come down to a mismatch between this kind of lar this the scale at all cost business model and what social media really needs to work, to function, to be humane. Just out of curiosity, how big is that community that you just described? How many people are in that community? It's about a couple hundred. Got it. Um, and, uh, but, of course, we can connect to the broader Fediverse. So, you know, many, many th hundreds of thousands of people participating in that. Um, but we are able to govern at the scale where you can actually get to know people. Makes sense. All right, Molly, I think this segues nicely to you because, you know, you're basically working sort of at the primitive layer that undergirds potentially a lot of these different communities that could exist in some way, shape, or form out in the Web3 world. How has that approach been undertaken with your work, and where are you seeing room for improvement as it relates to building some of that foundational layer? Yeah, I feel like, you know, Mastodon got a lot right. This idea of, like, uh, a local community with local community governance, but with an opportunity to expand into a wider um, kind of, like, uh, space where public conversation is happening, but you can intermediate the, the kind of interface between your community and the, the wider commons. Um, I, I think that that gets a lot right. The problem that you run into in the Mastodon case is you don't have portable data. So you actually can't move, if you move from, uh, you want to fork your community and start your own Mastodon server, or your current Mastodon server spins down, you can't move your data to another place. You're not actually in a global namespace. And so you don't have that, that ability to like actually own and move around your data. Um, with that data portability, which you can get through content addressing, through self-sovereign identities, um, then as when there's disagreements in local community governance, you can easily fork your foundations, you can move and, and change how you're going to govern, um, maybe as two separate or multiple separate communities. Um, and again, you can continue sharing all of that data more broadly, and each different sub-community can self-govern while still participating in a more broader public conversation. Because, you know, that's really what, you know, at the Twitter scale, you, you want access to all of that information, but you want to be able to set your own, you know, uh, paradigms around what you want to handle for bots, what you want to do in terms of a, you know, Sybil identification, you know, who can actually, you know, notify you and in, engage with your uh, presence in, in that community. And so that, that's something that I think bringing the content addressing pieces and some of the self-sovereign identity can really help solve those problems. Got it. How do you see this interacting with like the DAO conversation that's clearly popped up over the last year or two? Are we sort of talking about the same thing, right? The centralized social media is sort of the outward appearance, and I guess the DAO is the more inward-facing governance aspects. Do you have any thoughts on that? Or Nathan, any thoughts on that? 
feel like um, like DAOs really need this tooling in order to kind of like effectively communicate and govern locally, but also engage in kind of a wider wider community. Um, I think they are experimenting with some you know really good community governance tools, things like Soulbound tokens and other things that can kind of identify who's a co-member of a DAO. Um, but I think we're still we're still early days. There's a lot more experimentation needed. Yeah. Um we just got Gitcoin here for the last panel, and Max is uh, one of the largest donors for Gitcoin grants, and we, we got approached by so many anonymous hackers every day, and I don't really know where they're from, and they just approached from Twitter. And I think five months ago, we started to initiate some DAO tooling on Twitter, such as the, uh, the Assange DAO, the Constitution DAO, they can have their own Twitter page, they have the voting function that we provide from other DAO tooling on Twitter. So people are start to use the Twitter page to vote, and then governance, and then they work for the DAO, and they, they got paid from some token, right? And then they, they just post some random encrypted posts, then it's all beyond Twitter. Like, clearly Twitter can do all these in a relatively centralized way, but they're gonna ask for your ID, say, hey, okay, you got your, you got your payroll, you need your ID, and they're gonna work garden this thing in many bad ways. But, we're just providing this middleware and we see so many people are building these specific tools and then the, the next generation builder are coming on board. They don't really need to say, I run away. And as you mentioned, the sovereign um, identity is also very important. You can, pour, you, can, you can pour your work fruit away and then just you know, enjoy yourself. That's happening. So DAO is definitely a very important it's, it's like the digital factory, right? And it's every digital factory, you have a small DAO, yeah. Suji, I want to stick with you. I mean, I think it's really interesting that you're kind of building these things in the existing systems, right? You mentioned earlier that you're in discussions with Blue Sky, which is obviously Twitter's own decentralized social media effort. When you're talking to these incumbents, do they get really scared, or is there something that resonates with them about sort of incremental progress? This, this is to Suji. Oh, okay. I'd say it's, it's incremental. It's going to take a while. Um, here's some numbers. The maths down we all mentioned, Federer, started in 2016. And I believe they don't really have donor until 2017, 2018. We joined, become one of their donor in 2019. And till now, they haven't figured out how to really import this thing together with the Filecoin. And I believe it probably take another two, three years. And ENS, we love ENS. It's been around for four years, but right now, you spend $150 to get an ENS. It's really expensive, right? And they're waiting for layer two. They're waiting for many um, infras. But you know, the smart kids, they are um, working for bounties, and they get some air job for the ENS, and they got their own DID, and they start to use mask and Gitcoin together. And then the smart kids can teach the other kids. I think in the next generation are fully decentralized. They're just in the process. Um, and it's incremental. I, I, see, I see the great potential. Probably just another, I'd say probably just another four or five years, we're going to see um, at least more than 10 to 20% of Twitter users, they become a decentralized identity. And they're just having their own data, controlling their own data. Yeah. Nathan, I want to talk, oh, sorry, Molly, I know you're going to say something. Well, one, a thing that I was going to add to that was just, I think there's a lot of opportunity to decouple different layers of the decentralized social media stack. So you can think about the data creation that's happening kind of on an individual basis. You can think of the governments of your, your local community, which maybe DAOs are, are creating new tooling around doing that, that governance. And then you can also think about creating different decentralized front ends and different, um, you know, verifiable computation to do things like indexing and ranking of feeds for different social media. Like each of these can be kind of their own problem and solution, which you can then compose with each other. And you can end up with like different users or different communities optimizing for a different outcome. You have a marketplace of different solutions that can then all compete, interoperate, learn from each other and evolve instead of it being like one size fits all, as you were saying. Um, so I think there's a lot of opportunity there that as we break apart these layers of the stack, we'll see a lot more progress, a lot faster progress. There's a couple of groups like Matrix who's, um, you know, very open to that. It's, it's kind of like anyone can build their own kind of UI or application that interfaces with like the matrix communication protocol. And that really does create more space for groups to fork and differentiate and, and kind of iterate on, on how you want to view that data. And so I think that's a really good step in the right direction. 
Nathan, I want to ask you for some more tangible examples like that. What are communities that are doing this with some degree of success? When you look out across the landscape, what are the things that you're noticing that seem promising? In the social media, I, I mean, I think I was going to point to Matrix as well. You know, we use it in my lab at, uh, at CU. Um, just as we use Mastodon in my last in my intro to social media class last semester, um, these tools are actually you know I found really powerful from an educational perspective because they open people's minds um, and they, they they open the door. I, I actually though in thinking about examples, I, I want to go back to that DAO question, right? Because actually again, I think some of our most important examples. We, although we like to think of everything being new because of crypto or something, I actually think we can learn a lot from very old stuff. You know, a DAO is, in many cases, you know, a social club, an organization, a civic association. You know, it, it, it's, 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 it's in many ways a familiar thing that we're reinventing with new tools. And, you know, I think that's, those kinds of models are really important to start from. You know, that recognition that, you know, people do actually tend to first organize in, in fairly manageably sized groups and then they network with each other in particular ways. And then you start getting to a point of you know, building jurisdictions, building spaces of self-governance that don't necessarily overlap with territories, right? Territorial governance. And that to me is very exciting. You know, what connections can we build while, for instance, the United States and China are being really crappy to each other lately? You know, what, connection, what jurisdictions can we build so that, you know, so that we can counteract some of those tendencies and build, you know, the jurisdictions that we need so we can collaborate? Um, and similarly, you know, the, the, um, it opens a door for uh, uh, practices of governance. And there in DAOs, we do see some really exciting stuff happen. You know, I'm interested right now in how we can start taking seriously the responsibility that we're taking up here. I think there's, there is a lot of Pollyannish thinking in crypto right now. You know, a lot of sense that, you know, we just need to solve these basic security problems and everything's going to be cool. Um, we need to be preparing for the, the, the you know, the, the, the kinds of moments that have faced the, the human rights abuses, the Rohingya, you know, massacre, the kinds of abuses that we've seen with Web2, mass political manipulation. I think right now, as we start these conversations, we need to think beyond these kind of, these toys and recognize that if we are serious about replacing some of these institutions, we need infrastructure that can take on those big challenges. Um, and so this is a question both of the texture of small communities, but it, it does ultimately scale to some of the biggest questions that we face today. And I hope that we don't make the mistake that Web2 did of assuming that because our technology seems cool, you know, the problems of humanity will go away be because of it. We need to be designing for human flourishing and human safety um, from the beginning. And I feel like you know ownership of your own data and ability to to vote with your feet in a in a virtual land, uh, moving from community to community, are some of those kind of critical you know human values and rights that we would like to embed into the Web three technology that we're building. Um, I think there's there's still a lot of experimentation and iteration that's needed. So I'm you know really excited about the stuff that the Blue Sky team is doing. Um, the Fission team is doing some really cool work around um, UCANs and and you know encrypt user encrypted data so that you can have kind of like better user ownership. Um, I'm also excited about some of the stuff the Birdie team is doing, which is like. Uh, you know, peer-to-peer -peer offline messaging. So it's, you know, the opposite of a public conversation. What about a very private conversation that happens over Bluetooth when you're offline between two devices? So that even if, you know, the, the infrastructure we depend on today goes down, that we have kind of the, uh, you know, lib P2P Bluetooth communication protocols where we can coordinate and optimize with each other. Um, so I think there's a lot more of those, like, experiments that are needed so that we can keep building the next layer of technology and finding what works. Like, I don't think we're going to solve it all tomorrow. All right, Nathan, I want to go back to what you're saying, because I think, you know, tokens are arguably, you know, the key innovation of the Web3 moment, right? Uh, but that financialization, you know, has its downsides, right? 
So I guess my question to you is, as we look at these old systems that are being reinterpreted for the present day, mm -hmm. are tokens a help or a hindrance in making sure that those communities can work in a sustainable way going forward? The beautiful things about tokens is you can program them. And unfortunately, I think there's a culture in this space that says, you know, for instance, the attachment to immutability. No, immutability is a choice about how you decide to program the protocol. The choice of tokens, like, for instance, being soul bound, as we were discussing in the last session, or not being soul bound, that's a choice. Um, to me, the, question, the, the, the thing that's exciting about this moment is that we actually have the capacity to make those choices. And sometimes I feel like people are, you know, they're trying to solve lots of hard engineering problems and they're kind of trying to constrain their choices a bit. For instance, with token, with the question of financialization, which I think is extremely important, because I would argue financialization is what ruined Web2, you know, it was a decentralized technology also, by the way, <laughs> that was, that, that got, uh, uh, powered by venture capital, which has deep centralization uh, urges, um, built into its financial structure, um, we need to be very intentional about creating you know, different kinds of financial incentives and, and, and designs to ensure, for instance, that communities are able to finance and co-own things that they do. Why can't users of Twitter, for instance, self-finance the ability to buy the company and, and control it. It's because of the design of the financial system. So we need to, the question is not, you know, finance or no finance, token or no token, it's how do we design these things to ensure that we get community accountability outcomes rather than, rather than plutocratic outcomes. Suji, really curious for your perspective on that. Mass Network obviously has a token, it's called Mask. Curious for your perspective on how that helped or hurt build that community with your project. Yeah, I think it's definitely helpful at the beginning because just imagine the Uber case, they want to give stock to the Uber driver, but SEC just came in and say no. And I believe in Nathan's previous campaign, there at some point SEC came in and say you can't gather people's share and then vote for them. It's, well, soon um, SEC can come in the token space, but I think like you can actually, you can actually first and you're gonna create a really decentralized network at the beginning. That, that's the case of MassNet, we, we, we did a larger job and there's also a case for many great Web3 protocols. And then it will, it will actually need to um, modify a little bit um, in the late stage because the pure um, POS model we have is the, the richer you are, the more control you are, right? That's the, that's the same thing as the, the current Twitter. Um, so the soulbound token and there's many other like Delegating model is trying to solve a problem. At first, you don't you don't see that problem. You just give everyone five dollar to use your new Web three social stuff, and then soon you figure out okay, it's Elon Musk again buying your token, and now you lose the protocol. So you need to figure out how to make the citizen of the or the user of the network really really are are the master of the network, not really someone really billionaire or rich enough to buy it out. Right? So that's really important. Um, I think. For, for that perspective, not so many people are, are thinking or, or they're researching. Um, there's just maybe three, four examples out there. So that, that part still need a lot of work, yeah. Got it. Okay, Molly, last word to you. For decentralized social media bears like myself, what is something that you would advise me to look out for to indicate to me, a decentralized social media skeptic, that this stuff is actually working in a way that is meaningfully improving people's lives online. Yeah, I mean, I'd point you to a community that you can already see working today, like the, the Audius community is actually a really great one. They're building a decentralized SoundCloud where you have all of these music creators who are interfacing directly with their fans, no longer intermediated by kind of a central platform. They each host their own data. They're able to interface directly with their fans. I think they actually have a token now as well that kind of like collectively incentivizes uh, building an amazing community, helping kind of give back and, and you know, incentivize fans for, for helping push forward and helping others find music. Like, I think, I think there are great examples that are forming that you can go and look at today and be like, 
yeah, no, this is an upgrade. Like, I can find music here that I couldn't find somewhere else. I can interface with creators that I love in a way I couldn't before. I can support them more directly without intermediaries that are taking a massive cut of those profits. Um, so I think, I think some of those, those communities that are forming are a great example that you can look at now. Um, in the future, I think the thing to look forward to is um, when we have something like Twitter that, that we love and we can use for public conversation, but you can pick up your data and vote with your feet from moving from you know, one Twitter application UI or sub-community to another to another that each has different governance rules, different um, capabilities from a UI perspective. Maybe you can like things in one place and you can like send them to the moon somewhere else. Like, I, think, I think that sort of composability and, and uh, a marketplace of different applications and communities you can join um, will be you know, when it's really arrived. All right, we shall leave it there. This was great. Nathan, Suji, Molly, thanks for doing that. Join me in thanking our wonderful panel. We'll get off the stage. We wish you well.